It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Parag Kachalia all the way from San Ramon, California. It's about 30 minutes east of San Jose. And he says he does know the way to San Jose by Dion Warwick. He is a tenured associate professor and former vice chair of simulation technology and research at the University of Pacific. He is a fellow of the International and American College of Dentists, as well as the American Dental Association's Leadership Institute. He's also a member of the Om- Omicron Kappa Upsilon Honor Society, which obviously I must not be. In addition, he is a researcher as well as a published author in the areas of dental technology, digital diagnostics, contemporary fixed prosthodontics, and financial management. He was selected as one of the top 10 young educators in dentistry in the United States. He has lectured internationally in the areas of adhesive dentistry, cosmetic dentistry, photography, CAD CAM technology, fixed prosthodontics, treatment planning, erosion, and digital diagnostics. He acts as a consultant for many dental materials, dental technology companies, and helps guide product development. He's a member of the Seattle Study Club and the Catapult Speakers Bureau. He is also a member of the Celerant Best of Class Selection Committee. As a forward thinker, he is frequently interviewed regarding his vision of dentistry's future. Throughout his time in academia, he has maintained a private practice geared toward restorative dentistry with his wife and fellow Pacific alum, Dr. Charity Duncan. He believes his continual involvement in providing patient care, as well as a role in academia, has given him a unique balance that allows him to blend the best of both worlds. In his spare times, he enjoys traveling with his wife and his nine-year-old son. As a family, they make it a point to travel to at least one country outside of North America every year so that they can experience different cultures and truly understand the world. In addition to traveling, he enjoys golfing and photography. I want you to know that I've lectured in 50 countries and I always take one, two, three, or four of my boys. And it is now, now that my boys are 22, 24, 26, and 28, some of their most profound memories were all in foreign countries. And I, I, I think it's so funny when Americans um, will badmouth another country, like, like socialized medicine. Well, that's socialized medicine. Dude, you're not smart enough to have ever gone to Scandinavia. <laughs> You've never been to Australia, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland. And if you have, you'd want to live in that country, not Oklahoma City. You know what I mean? So it's uh, when you're born in a country and all you do is drink their Kool-Aid and believe all their thoughts, you're, you're not educated. And I think that I, if, I had to, if I had to pick between sending my son to four years of college or sending him four years out of the country, I'd pick send him out of the country. So kudos to you. Your boy will be so smart because of that. So I, I, I called you. It's an honor that you came on the show. What are, what are you passionate about today? So I'm, I mean, I think it's great we here, you know, talk about. I think my passion really lies in letting our patients know about what we can do. You know, dentistry has hit this point where we're almost becoming commoditized. Everyone believes they can just walk into any new dentist office that's opened up on the street and they get the exact same level of care. So what can we do today to change that? And a lot of what I think about is technology's influences, right? So I grew up in Silicon Valley. I remember when Apple was one company and Intel was one building and Intel was one building and they really weren't that big of a deal. And little by little by little, all these companies kind of grew up and developed. But the thing they always hit on was that connection, right? There was a connection with, in their case, the consumer, in our case, the patient, and how they built that connection, in their case, was technology, right? I think we can leverage technology today to, to let patients know what's happening in their mouth, what's happening with the oral health care, and show them that dentistry is much more than fixing teeth. It's, it's a whole different place versus putting a filling in a tooth. And there's so much more we can, we can do. Well, you know, it was the, you know, when I got out of school in the 80, in 87, it was right in the boom of the dental materials re- technological revolution. And that was right. the foundings of uh, cosmetic dentistry, adhesive dentistry, bleaching, bonding, veneers. And then mm-hmm. probably about 1995, all these companies you just mentioned started the technological revolution, which has led to digital x-rays, computers, CBCTs, and all kinds of things. So we're, we're really in the middle of a technological explosion. Absolutely. And patients have so much access to information today, right? They can Google everything. It's become the world of Dr. Google. It's not even Dr. Oz anymore. It's Dr. Google. Let's go there first, right? So, but the problem is Dr. Google has a lot of really good answers, but there's a lot of garbage on there as well. So how do we get our patients to understand what's good information versus what's inaccurate information? And it's our job to do that. Well, my my most passionate thing, um, I, I started in 87, and I was drilling, filling, and billing, and, and the pulpotomies were off the chart. Right. So I closed down every Friday for a year and got Phoenix to Florida at the water. 
And uh, so that was an 89 and the Arizona State Dental Association gave me the Arizona award for Florida and Phoenix. And then, but they put a timeline on it to expire it in 20 years. So we just had to do it again. And if you Google water fluoridation, 99% of the sites are fake news. It's a communist plot. Right. It's a toxic deal. So when, when you go, so that's the only thing I'm really an expert on. I mean, I've read every PubMed article ever right. published on water fluoridation and the internet is taking you back to the Flintstones on that subject. And that's the only one I really, really, really know. And you can't find any quality information on the internet about water fluoridation. Absolutely not. And so the, the tough part of the patient phase today is as academics and, and healthcare providers, we talk about evidence-based dentistry, right? Well, what's evidence-based dentistry on the internet? It's, well, what are you, do you rank on page number one of Google? And that certainly <laughs> is evidence-based for the patient, right? They don't get to page number 200 where they might actually have true evidence. So we can't expect patients to be able to filter that information, right? That's our responsibility. And to do it in a way that's appropriate. It's not beating them over the head, saying you must read this journal. It's just talking about the right things. But to do that, we have to educate ourselves first. Starts with us, number one. And, and, and the scary thing is when you point them out and you say, well, this is what the Centers for Disease Control, one-fourth right. of everyone in Phoenix, when you say the Centers for Disease Control, they think anti-government, they're shillings Absolute. for right. the pharmaceutical right. industry, it's right. all corruption. And it's like, so what I am most alarmed by is that the biggest institutions in the world, whether it be the Supreme Court, the Centers for Disease Control, a quarter of the public thinks those should all be closed down and they're, they're, they're corrupt and they're the bad guy. And it's like, wow, we live in a society where one fourth of Americans think the 15,000 people that work for the CDC are paid shills for the, for the, <laughs> for the, uh, you know, the uh, fertilizer industry. It's like these, right. these guys are dedicating their entire life to fight disease, and one-fourth of Americans think they're corrupt people taking money from fertilizer companies. Right. It's, it's sad, isn't it? It's just unbelievable. Oh, my yeah. God. It makes, <laughs> yeah. it makes you lose faith in democracy because every one right. of those idiots has the right to vote. <laughs> then you go to Singapore right. and China where they don't have the right, right. to vote, and right. those are the fastest-growing economies in the world. And it just to me, it just looks like law and order and everything's organized like singapore who could go to singapore and come back with a list of complaints oh absolutely it's unbelievable i had an opportunity to go to singapore last year and just the level of organization and commitment to kind of moving the country forward is unbelievable right yeah and, and so we so we live in chaos so that every four <laughs> right. years we have a right to vote between two sociopaths you're either a donkey or a republican and they're both sociopaths taking bribes um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but when you talk about technology, I'm going to be dead, dead honest with you. These, Please, these, these yeah. kids come out of school and they say, they say, bro, I got $350,000 student loans. And if I buy a CAD cam, there's a buck 50. If I buy a CBC, there's another hundred. And if I buy a BioLace, there's another hundred. I could double my student loan debt with three purchases. So what is the return on investment? What do I have to buy? to be a high quality dentist where you'd want me to treat your nine year old son and what is not necessary to be a high quality dentist. Absolutely. And, and stage number one, I would say is I completely agree with you. Our students are strapped with this half a million dollar loan package, right? They have all sorts of issues occurring in terms of payback. Do you go and buy all these hundred thousand dollar pieces of equipment? I would say absolutely not. When we talk about technology today, it doesn't have to be a comb beam CT. It doesn't have to be a CAT cam unit. It can for, it can for all its purposes be a, be a camera. Be a simple digital camera you can take some photos with and shoot that over to your iPad or iPhone and start to talk to patients about the basics of what's going on. And as time goes on, sure, you can build into these other more extravagant technologies. But stage number one is have a camera, for God's sakes. You know, start, start there so patients start to visualize what they see. You know, Two-thirds of all learning we know occurs through visualization, not through auditory communication. It's not just talking and seeing each other. I mean, let's think about what we're doing right now. We get to communicate with one another over Skype. We weren't able to do that 25 years ago. We can have a, a conversation, actually see each other, and that communication piece that we get is very different. Yeah, but now, Microsoft bought Skype, so it'll probably go to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> it'll probably, uh, within a year or two, it'll just freeze up and, and we'll forget the word even exists. Well, I don't know. you got a new CEO now, right? Steve Ballmer's playing bad. He's got a basketball team to worry about. He's not there anymore. So he's over. we got a new CEO up in Seattle. And you know what that basketball team, what's the name of that basketball team? It has the Clippers, yeah. <laughs> but what, what's, what, no, the, the Seattle's. The Seattle uh, basketball team. Oh, so the Seattle team, yeah, that is now the Oklahoma City Thunder. 
But it was the Seattle Supersonics. Supersonics, correct. And you know what that was named after? That's where Boeing was, and that was when uh, after they were uh, they were starting a supersonic transport deal. It ended up going to France and England and being the uh, the Concorde. Yeah. But uh, that that Boeing was most excited when they started that team about the future of supersonic transport. I had no idea. That's that's great. See, I got to learn something today. I even educated you. That's Imagine that's that. Right. Right. So, so I, I agree with the digital camera. I think it's the highest return on investment because you started off with talking about Google. And when you go to a website and all you see is a mugshot of some dentist, it looks like he's being arrested for a DUI. <laughs> and then you say you're a cosmetic dentist and there's no photograph saying this is Dr. Prague's actual work. And you say you're right. an implantologist. There should be three or four before and after pictures. And I've always thought that a digital camera is the highest return on investment because you got to build up your website with your own work. And, and these, these companies that build websites, they always say, well, doctor, send me all the photos of the work you've done. And 95% say, I don't have a single photo. Exactly. Isn't it amazing how many websites we go to, we see the same three amalgams being replaced by <laughs> a thousand practices out there. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So that patient's got around. So. No, I, but I think, yeah, you know, the, my whole thing is let's visualize things. So camera number one, right? When the time is right, consider digital impressioning, but not necessarily to but, replace but, but, but go material. back to the digital camera. My, my yeah, homies, they, they always want names. You, you have a make their decisions easier for them. There's probably one thousand digital cameras on Amazon. Do you have any any short list? Well, I think my short list of companies that do a really nice job with imaging are going to be kind of Air Techniques. We're going to so Air Tech, uh, Acteon, and probably CareStream in the cable camera. Those four do a nice job for traditional everyday cameras that get launched. Okay, Air Techniques, CareStream. Air Techniques. What was CareStream? CareStream. And then Acteon. Acteon. Right, and then uh, Dexis has a new camera, a new high definition camera as well. Okay. So yeah. Air so think, Techniques, Acteon, CareStream, and Dexis. CareStream used to be Kodak, right? Then they switched. CareStream used to be Kodak. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now, they quite also frankly, own uh, Softent. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. digital camera was your number one, and when you so when you said digital camera, you meant intraoral camera. Well, no, actually both. So I would say intra is a nice place to be. Okay, but if we're talking about a student on a budget, you know, these cameras might be three to six thousand dollars somewhere in there, right? They got to school. Stage number one, I would say, some kind of an ex, even an extraoral camera is to look at a a DSLR type camera, whether it's a Canon or Nikon, whatever it is. You know, get a ring flash and a, and a macro lens, and that camera is going to be with you 10 plus years. Those things are workhorses. They're there a long time. With a ring flash as opposed to a point flash? Correct. So there's ring flash or two point flashes. If you want to get into kind of higher level aesthetics and really show teeth and shadows, you can do two point flashes. But if you want a, a nice get started everyday camera, you can do ring flash. Interesting okay. enough, uh, Smile Line USA this year released a, cam uh, a flash system called the Smile Light MDP, or Smile Light Mobile Dental Photography. It comes from Italy in a group called Sal Italiano. And that's pretty in ingenious. What they did was they took, a, all, for all intents and purposes, a lighting system and attached it to a smartphone. So every time your smartphone improves, every time your you know, Google Pixel or Android device or iPhone improves, you get new hardware. And it's essentially a flash system for about five hundred dollars that goes onto your phone, and can really you can get started really well with it. Okay, I'm going to try to find that. Um, what's the name of that company? WWW, it's also, what is it? Uh, in the U.S., Smile Line USA. Smile Line USA. USA. And it says superb Swiss quality dental lab. So they sell they sell dental lab equipment, but there's also a product called the Smile Light MDP or Smile Light. Uh, mobile dental photography. Do you think that's the best camera they, they should get? I think that's a, a nice place to get started. They kind of, you know, you can take some intro photos with it with a mirror. You can get some nice extra photos. Easily have it go onto your smart device to show patients. Okay, so so they have they have a camera. And what do you think of that cost? So it's about four hundred fifty to five hundred dollars uh, oh, for cheap. A, yeah, to get a flash put onto your smartphone, it'll take beautiful photos. I think that's a great starting point. So you take a photo and it goes right to your iPhone? It goes right to your iPhone. That right, is right. really cool. Yeah. Man, I, w I wish, th I mean, that, that's, that's good enough for an article. I, I wish you'd just write an article on that for Dentaltown because these, these websites, I mean, everybody is searching their dentist out on their website. They're all typing in right. the number one search word for a dentist is near me. 
So they type in Dennis near me, their, their right. iPhone, smartphone, GPS, knows where they're at. And then they right. look at two or three websites and, and three out of three of those websites were about five to 10 years ago. There's nothing there. There's no video. So like when I see you, I already like you. You're more, I can tell you're a good guy. They, they don't even have a YouTube video showing the human side of them or talking. Right. They don't have any dental work. Um, they should get an extra, they should get an extra old camera, get some work done and uh, build up their website and put a damn YouTube video on there. So they know they're a human because um, it's, it's basically just trust and comfort. I don't know who you are and who, who is, how, who is Dr. Fayran? I mean, who, who is that? They, they, right. they want to see Dr. Fayran and, uh, and then they want to see that I've actually done some work. I mean, we're surgeons. We're, where's the before and after pictures. That's right. So that's not, so what else? So, so your first was, a digital intro camera. Your second Correct. was an extra oral camera. Um, what, 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 uh, then what's your third? Yeah. So when we start to look, I would say the next thing I would look at is intro impressioning. Let's look at a digital scanner. And, but I use it. And, right, please. I was, was going to say, I use digital scanners for much more than impression material replacement. So it's not about replacing the impression material. Really? Absolutely. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that. What, what so, does that yeah. mean when you said that? So I've been using, you know, a couple of, I have a university life and a private practice life. At the university, I've pretty much had a chance to play with every scanner that's out there. In my with the true definition is what we use quite a bit from 3M, and then three shape trio systems what I use quite a bit in practice. So what I've done now is I take those as I'm scanning the patient, and once it's on the screen, I actually have my assistant or a staff member kind of hold up an iPad and record the conversation I'm having with the patient as I discuss their case. So as I point things out on the digital scan, say, you know, your bite's really deep here, you've worn these teeth down, et cetera, and I'm pointing things out uh, on the digital scanner, my assistant can stand back and actually record the conversation I have with the patient. So what that allows us to do is I can now send a video file to that patient. So I can record these things, have a little video file on my tablet computer, and send that over to the patient so they have their new patient experience in our office. So we're much more into scanning, you know, I wouldn't say all of our new patients, but a number of our new patients today. As we scan them from day one to create a digital record and a communication piece. What, so you like the trios made from, um, who's the company that makes trios? So a uh, three shape makes three trios. Shape, three shape out of uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, right? That's correct. Correct. And, and you like the trios. And, and how much is the trios? The trios runs between thirty five and forty five thousand dollars somewhere in there. And you and you uh, you think that's a buy? You know, I, 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 would I like the price to come down? Absolutely. But for what we have today, for the bells and whistles that it has, I think it's you know that's that's the price point. Unfortunately, now the other side of the spectrum. What's interesting is historically in dentistry, we thought well, that things like I'm cost trying to um, I'm trying to retweet your Twitter so my homies can find you. You're at Tech DDS. Oh no, that's, so that's Instagram. My Instagram. Instagram. I don't. I'm not really on Twitter, unfortunately, Howard. I, I have a. I have a. URL there, but I don't do much with you, it. You, well, you know, um, that's what everybody thought. But after uh, the you found out after the last election that if you have five million Twitter followers, <laughs> you can become the president. I, I actually am falling in love the most with Twitter. You know why? Because you build up a Facebook uh, following, and then sure. when you make a post, Facebook won't. Uh, like I have three hundred thousand Facebook followers. If yeah. I make a post and don't give them any money, only a hundred people will see it. If I give them a hundred dollars. Yeah. Only one out of three will see it. Yeah. I have to give them 300 bucks to boost my post for them to push it out to the 300,000 people that like my page. So I've uh, never uh, given Twitter a dollar. But Facebook right. and Instagram, the more you use them, the more money you have to give them. But Twitter, I mean, I mean, Trump called it right. Twitter, you got yeah. 20,000 followers, you send a tweet, boom, they all get it instantly. It makes sense. So uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a, a Twitter convert now. You know, what I, you know what I like the most about digital scanners? What's that? Is the fact that um, I think the number one link for quality in a dental office is to get everybody who's used, putting their hands in the mouth to wear loops. Um, dentists will 100%. complain their hygienist doesn't get the tartar off as she's 45 years old and not wearing loops, but he has them on. He complains right. the dental assistant didn't clean the cement off the implant case and all this stuff, and she didn't have loose on. Everybody working on a penis that needs magnification. And the first time I uh, did digital scanning was with my, uh, um, I looked at my prep on a screen 40 times larger, and I thought a blind chimpanzee had cut the prep. 
And oh. I'm, I don't think I've ever scanned a tooth and not been humbled instantly and gone back three or four times. Um, and I, I, so I think uh, the endodontist, right. the greatest endodontist I know, say, before they obturate, they pull uh, um, just a microscope, just eight or 12. Sure. And sure. they'll look down there and they might find a missing canal. They might say, oh, my God, that one canal still has crap in it. Um, magnification, when you work with your hands, magnification is pretty intense. Absolutely. We can, we can, it goes back to the adage, we can only treat what we can see, right? right? And how do we? How can we see something with our naked eyes at all times? Like Distal buckle, tooth number 15, the only people that find those carriers are my hygienist, right? So when she, when she finds a bath there, i got to treat it. So i got to make sure I'm wearing good magnification. And scanning takes that to the nth degree. We're not looking at preps at two, three, four times. It's 50 to 100 times, if not more, on the screen. And you know, the more precise we can get, the better off we are. And so the, the beauty work, is. So you work with um, the 3M company at the university, and you work with um, the Copenhagen Three Shape uh, Trios at private practice. Um, the I, I hear that what's best about 3M's true definition is that it's it's the smallest intro camera. Sure. But the negative is that that you have to use powder. And then right. the trios is uh, all that and a bag of chips. But um, does it? I I, I kind of sometimes it frustrates me when dentists say, "Well, I don't want to use powder." Well, you should be saying, "I want to use powder if that is a better scan." Like like when bonding agents. Right. right. I still right. think the best bonding agents we ever had were acid etch, primer, adhesive. But the dentist is like, oh, "I want it in one step." I want I want prompto pop. I'm just right. going to scrub it. It's like, dude, right. you're a dog. I I don't want to get a bypass right. by some surgeon that thinks like that. I'd rather go to a cardiovascular surgeon who says, "This is going to take me twice as long, but it'll be three times better." That's the guy I want. But dentists seem to be like now. Now the the problem with posterior composites they shrink. So what's the dentist? Uh, what's the dentist response? I think I want bulk fill. Hell yeah! Just plug it in there, smash it down my thumb. <laughs> And hit it with a lot because right. I can't do this layered increment bullshit. I mean, you right. know, it's like right. so. Right. So, so I don't care if you have to um, put some powder on if that means your gosh darn scan's going to be a lot better. But what do you think about true definition? Smaller, but you have to have powder. Trio seems like they're just exploding. What, what, what if if one of my homies listening to you right now saying, "Come on, I don't got all day. Which one should I buy?" What would you tell them? Well, honestly, what I tell people in my lectures is those two are the, are the two most accurate scanners today. The low end of the price curve and the most expensive end of the price curve. Are, from an accuracy standpoint, they're almost identical. That's what's amazing, right? And this is all third, from a third-party data standpoint, not you know what the company tells us today. But if you go to Journal Pros last couple of years, those two scanners come out top-notch. Powder, 10 years ago, I was concerned about powder when we had to put a lot of powder on to get a scan. We put 35 microns of powder on something. The true definition scanner, you're dusting it. You can barely see the powder. So I'm not concerned at all about powder today. And I think it's a great place to enter the digital spectrum. Is you can get in for sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars somewhere in there, and you get a very highly accurate scan. If I had a crown done in my mouth today, I'd use either one of them, no question. But it seems like they're actually um, cheaper because every every lab owner that I talk to, I mean a lab owner, not an MBA, right. but the guy that right. actually works at the bench, right. they all say the same thing. They're running about 6% remakes with uh, polyvinyl, right. and they're right. running 1% with their scans. Right. And right. then a lot of the labs actually um, charge you less money if you send in a scan because That's they right. don't need a monkey to pour up the impression with stone, trim the dye. Right. So since they're skipping steps, so if you looked at the chair time cost, Right. A five out of a hundred crowns where the patient comes in, it's a deadhead appointment, meaning like, you know, if a semi goes from Phoenix to San Jose and drops off a load of tomatoes, it's not going to make a penny unless it picks something up to San Jose and, and brings it back. back. Right. That's right. why the individual truck driver is out of business because you can't deadhead. So if a patient comes in for a crown seat and you scheduled a half an hour and the only thing that came out of that five out of a hundred times is to re-impress, oh my God, that's that a kills fortune. You. That, that kills Absolutely. you. Kills so you. if you could go from six percent to one percent remakes, you have you, you would have to. Have you seen the labs say um, charging you less if you send a scan? Absolutely, because uh, the vast majority of our single unit poster crowns, we have no models at all. So they we get the crowns back faster, so we're getting them back in roughly seven days or so versus two weeks. 
So patients are happy over long, you know, shorter kind of temporary times. At the same time, I'm not getting any models back. So there's a because if they make me a model, that model is never touched until it comes into my office. And then I do this and say, great, here's twenty dollars for it, right? Because mm. the model is simply for us to feel good. The, the lab doesn't use it; it's a variable. There's no reason for it. Now, if you get a, if you're doing six, eight, ten units, different story. But for a single unit posterior, no reason for the model. Oh, okay, but finish that thought. Um, that just yeah. flew over her head. She's 25 years old. Why? Why does that work for a single unit, but why would a prosthodontist not do it for a full arch? So it, now, at some point, will it work for a full arch? Potentially. The only thing we can do is, for a single unit crown, the reason it works so well is we have the adjacent teeth as landmarks, we have the opposing as landmarks. So we can build a crown out to proper occlusion, contour function, with no issues for a single unit. When we get to multiple units, start thinking about guidance and kind of waxing the full arch, et cetera, there could be some potential little issues on the occlusion standpoint. But even that's getting a lot better. Like, I, I do three unit bridges today with no issues. You know, I delivered three crowns yesterday in a quadrant. Uh, we had no issues. They're all modelless. So I'm becoming more and more comfortable. But people would say today, you know, if we're going to do more than really three or four units, consider getting uh, can, but you know, digital you, fine, you but get a model. Profound. You, you said on a single unit, you got a tooth in front and a tooth behind. Yeah. Talk right. to any lab man. What's the biggest problem to the last one the second mold there's Absolutely. nothing behind it Absolutely. and uh, they, they're going to call up and say you know wh why do you think the second mold or the fact that there's no tooth behind it why do you think that is such a nightmare and do you think it almost um rules out a triple tray and go to a full arch tray just so that you get some other tripod contact or what why, why do you think the second molar is always off the most in occlusions yeah the second molar there, there's so many variables back there right i mean from the standpoint of Where's this patient closing to? Second, at the second molar standpoint, first point of contact, we start negating those factors. We start pulling them out. So triple trays, I was never a big fan of them on second molars. But digital scanning, I'm okay with that. I'm perfectly fine scanning a quadrant in the, from a digital standpoint because my, my bite registration is still true. It's not collapse of the tray. It's based on what the patient's dentition goes to. So, so the uh, the the 3M's uh, true definition is seventeen thousand. Is that right? That's correct. And what is That's the correct. trios uh, three shape? Between thirty five and forty five thousand. Thirty five to 40, what? Just depending on what bells and whistles. Exactly, because they have a, a card standpoint, a laptop standpoint, black and white versus color. They kind of operate off a Tesla model, where you get all the bells and whistles to start with, but they turn off the features until you pay the extra if you want them. So you can start with a black and white scanner today or a monochrome scanner for about 35. And if you decide you want to go to color later on, on you, you call your distributor and say, hey, I want color. Here's a check for seven to 10,000, turn it on for me. Yeah, and when you go, I, I should not say this on the air, but since yeah. I'm completely insane and uh, don't have that little birdie telling me what not to say, every time I've ever gone to some of those foreign countries, you see Americans down there buying stuff because they say, well, if I fly to uh, Germany, I can get the uh, the CAD CAM forty thousand less because I don't have to give Patterson its cut. So they literally right. go down there, they'll buy the damn uh, Cirac machine and fly it home. And it's sure. the same with uh, when I was in Copenhagen. There mm -hmm. were dentists that said, "Well, it was actually cheaper to go to Copenhagen, Denmark, and have a vacation with my family and buy it there <laughs> and bring it home my and deal." And the biggest savings is every time I've ever been to Hong Kong, New Delhi, or Brazil. You know, they'll sell that $500 a bonding agent for clear fill SC, you know, $500 sure. a bottle, and they'll sell it in Brazil for 50 <laughs> So they'll go down there and buy a year's supply of their composites and bonding agent. It won't even take out one suitcase. They say, yeah, my wife and I just spent a week in Rio, and, and it was free because we bought our bonding agent. Bon Oil is $100 a barrel. Bonding right. agents are between $1.2 million to $1.5 million <laughs> a barrel. I think every drug dealer, instead of risking going to jail, they should just start making illegal bonding, bonding agent, agent right. because right. that stuff is, uh, it, I mean, when you, a bottle of bonding agent costs more than the equal weight of heroin or cocaine. What's wrong, what's wrong with that picture? Why, why does heroin and cocaine cost less than Clearfill SC per gram? But look at that packaging. Isn't it amazing packaging? Oh, my God. <laughs> Crazy. Guys. So, so you, you mentioned labs. So which labs are you using and, and give you a discount to send in a scan versus an impression? Right. So we're uh, primarily for a case today. We use like a, a lab called TechSource. 
So tech source is out of, out of Texas. Tech source out of Texas. Tech, tech source, yes. I, I think it's just outside of Dallas. So how did how did you in San Jose <laughs> end up finding a lab clear in Dallas? Well, isn't that the beauty of digital is my digital impression can go to anywhere in the world at the same time. So, so is it tech like T, uh, tech, T-E-C-H or text as in T-E-X? T-E-C-H. So T-E-C-H source, tech source. See, I would never, ever use Tech Source Dental because they're outside of Dallas and they're probably those obnoxious Dallas Cowboy fans. <laughs> and being an Arizona Cardinal purist, I could never use anything within 100 miles of Dallas. Oh, that was Cowboys. <laughs> so, how, what would Tech Source call, uh, you know, the, the, the number one crown is a first baller. What would they charge right. me if I sent them uh, Impergum? And what would they charge me if I sent them a scan? You have about a twenty dollar difference between the two. So I think it's one nineteen or so versus ninety nine. Okay, one nineteen versus ninety nine. And then on these scanners, do they do these companies charge you per scan? It once you buy the scanner, do you, can you send unlimited scans, or do you have to pay every time you use it? Yeah. So for the for the most part, the whole click fee world is gone. You don't you no longer pay per scan. We moved past that, but you do pay you do pay a monthly fee or monthly or yearly fee for the scanners. And and what is the monthly what is the monthly yeah. yearly fee for True Def or Three Shape? Uh, for True Def, it's about two hundred dollars a month. And then Three Shape does theirs a little bit differently. It depends on your distributor. So let's but ballpark is about two thousand dollars a year. So one eighty ish a month, one sixty a month. Uh, two thousand a year versus uh twelve so twelve hundred a year. For True Def and two thousand a year for Three Shape. Now, does that is that bundle like warranty updates, all that, or is that or, or not? Yeah, so let's go for us. So True Def is about two hundred per month, so about twenty four hundred a year. Oh, Oh, twenty four hundred a month. Twenty four, and then Three Shape is about two. So they each have slight differences. So I think in True Definition's case, the first year the warranty is included, and the second year there might be an, a slight additional fee. And I believe the same thing's true with uh, Three Shape. But it all depends on how much you pay in the front end with Three Shave. They modify your monthly based on what you pay on the front end. Huh. So that that's that. So so when you buy a Three Shave True Definition scanner, you're going to be paying two hundred dollars a month, twenty four hundred dollars a year, right? In, right. In, in perpetuity. That's and right. with Three Shave, you're going to be paying one hundred and sixty six a month in perpetuity. Right. So you know, along those the monthly fees. You know, when I first saw those, honestly, I was irritated. I was like, man, I'm already paying X thousands of dollars for a scanner, and now I got to pay this monthly fee. So while it's frustrating and no one likes to pay a monthly fee, I got to say the software improvements over time with both companies have been pretty spectacular. So my my three shape scanner today, I bought it three years ago, is very different today than it was three years ago because of the software upgrades, right? Without doing any hardware upgrades. So the the money we pay monthly is almost an incentive for innovation for the companies to keep pushing forward versus just selling you something and not getting any updates. So well, I don't like to pay it, but at least I'm getting something out of it. Well, it's it's a um, it's a feast or family. You can't run. Uh, it, it was actually one of the first, uh, the first billionaire that ever. Um, so yeah, here it is. Uh, so your dental lab, Tech Source Dental, is at ts underscore dental, and sure. I will. And their their pin tweet is uh, actually an Itero scanner. Check out the mini Itero element scanner marketing resource now available for download. And then the uh, second one is love seeing this in my mill, the new 3M Lava Aesthetic Fluorescent FCZR Game Changer. That's a beautiful that material. What, That's, what, yeah, it's a new, it's a new uh, an, kind of anterior zirconia, you know, translucent zirconia. It's absolutely beautiful. It's really nice. The new 3M Lava Aesthetic Fluorescent. What's FC ZR zirconia? What's FC? Yeah, so uh, usually it's full contour. FC is full okay, contour. Okay, so zirconia. so 3M lava aesthetic fluorescent full contour zirconium game changer uh, at 3M uh, oral care. Interesting. Right. right. Um, so you like that? You like that better than um, um, Ivoclair's? Uh, the Nemax or? Well, the or do they do they they still do Empress on the interior? They do. They yeah. They still have it. So I would say it's not quite an Empress or an Emax. But it's getting closer to the Emax as far as how it looks. But it gives you an ability if you need to kind of conventionally cement something, maybe a more subject to a margin, you're, not con you're concerned about moisture, et cetera, needed something stronger in a bicuspid region for a patient, does a nice job. And it's where about, I draw the line is just male. I mean, 
Yeah. I mean, men don't show their, I, I, I do the aesthetic health compromise stuff on, on women, um, with, um, sure. you know, some high smiling because they, right. they care so much. But when grandpa's in there with a liver spot on his head, <laughs> uh, he, he, he wants it to last the longest. He really would rather have an amalgam right. on a class right. five that go to the grave than your AACD inert plastic. <laughs> right. You know, composite, and I, I think, I think when, <laughs> in fact, let, let, let me just talk about that. Um, I, you know, there's so much disturbing information on amalgam. Like, um, you know, the insurance companies say the amalgams are lasting 38 years, and the posterior right. compositors last in six and a half. You see these dentists that go get their fellowship in the AACD, and in comes Alzheimer's mother who can't recognize her daughter. And when you put those uh, root surface cavities with inert plastic composite, they're lasting sure. six months. And when you use amalgam, they're lasting five years. Now, who in their right state of mind would use composite? And then when you're, and then when you, and then the doctor says, "I don't even have amalgam in my office." Okay, you're an extremist. You you've already passed thinking. Um, well, can you use a glass onomer? Well, that's only used in Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Them are socialist <laughs> countries. I'm from Texas, damn it. I don't use that Japanese glass on them. And, and, and I, I'm a fellow of the AEC. No, dude, you're an idiot is what you are. I mean, why why would you put composite in a Alzheimer's patient who doesn't know her children's name? That's my question to you. Yeah, I, I think you had kind of hit the nail on the head from a standpoint. We have to pick the right restorative material for the patient that's in our chair. It's not a blanket category across the board, right? It is a blanket no. category for all women. It, it, a woman will say, um, I'll say, would you, what, 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 do you want your filling tooth colored or do you want uh, silver or gold? Well, I, no, I, I want, what, what's natural? And I'll say, well, right. actually, the, the amalgam is natural because it starts off as a hydrogen sun and the, and the gravity compresses two into helium. And then when the, the, the whole thing turns into helium, the gravity is so intense it explodes, a supernova, and there's your silver, mercury, zinc, tin, copper, all natural. The composite right. stuff at 3M is made by men in lab coats pouring chemicals in a beaker, and they're like, hey, uh, yeah, that's what I want. Okay, then why did you ask for what's natural? What's <laughs> natural, right? What natural like what? Hepatitis C? Natural like, you know, a tornado? Um, I mean, it, it's – so I it, – if you if a woman says, well, um, what do you think of the tooth color? And you say, well, it will be a 105% chance it will cause thyroid cancer. They say, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I just put, after 30 years of this shit, I'm not going to introduce anything. <laughs> Women want the aesthetic health combine. They'll do anything to look better. I remember when I was five years old, I was watching my overweight Grandma Mary pulling herself into a girdle, and it just looked like she's going to kill herself. And I said to her, I said, Grandma, why, why do you put that on? And she snapped me, because I'd rather look good than feel good. And, uh, you know, she's cranking this uh 200 pounds into a Barbie doll girl. So women, it's just blanket category. It's tooth colored. <laughs> but gosh darn it, when I say to a little boy, hey, you're six years old. If I put in silver, I'm the only one who'll see it, but it'll last until you're my age. If I put it in tooth colored like your mama's asking me, I'm going to have to give you this here shot every six years. What do you want? They go, I don't want a shot every six years. I want the silver one. Grandpa, same thing. If he's got a liver spot, he says, I want whatever lasts the longest for the cheapest. Right. Okay, let's go right. amalgam and let's go. Right. Uh, and if you want the best crown, I still think it's a gold crown. Every one of my fillings is gold. Oh, there's no question. We, we still can't say we have something better than gold, right? There's no question gold's still the best. It just becomes a point of let's educate our patients, let them know it's available, and leave the choice in their hands. And so I practice about 15 minutes east of Berkeley, California. My patients, they're not accepting any kind of metal today, right? They right. barely accept the, they barely accept drinking water. <laughs> that's that's a debate in itself, right? So we got to fight those battles. Now, with that being said, we got to be really good at how we place our restorations, right? You can't. We know we can't throw a resin in. You do, it's going to fail. We got to make sure it's uh, t you know, it's technique sensitive. Do the right things. Don't take the shortcuts with it, and we'll get longevity. But are those longevities that of amalgam? Maybe, maybe not. As long as you take the time to put it in. Properly. If you just throw it in there, it's going to fail, and it's going to make well, it really. Bad well, every, everybody says that they're they're they do it better, but when yeah. you when you see a hundred million claims processed, yeah. right. so right. everyone must suck because they only last in six months. It's kind of like endo. Sure. Ask a general dentist what percent of your root canals fail, Doc. You've been doing in root canals for thirty years. Well, knock on wood, knock on wood. <laughs> I never had one. I say, okay, dude. Well, there's 
4,000 endodontists who work 40 hours a week and right. three out of every four root canals are retreat. That's a shitload of immigration because <laughs> uh, none of the dentists here have ever had a root canal fail. And, but when you look at insurance claims, it wakes you up. When a general right. dentist does a molar sure. in five years, sure. um, 10% have been extracted. When an endodontist does a molar in five years, 5% have been extracted. Sure. We're not debating sure. whether it's working, failed. We're right, just talking right. extracted. So right. 10% of molars fail by general right. dentists. 5% of molars fail by endodontists. And right. your damn posterior white fillings last six and a half years. And what's the dentist's answer? Bulk fill. So my question is, what do you think of bulk fill? I mean, if they're only lasting six and a half years, why don't we get that down to five? Yeah, so I'll have, I'll, I'll have to be candid here. So I did the clinical studies for sonic fill. So you should understand that. The audience should understand that. So the clinical studies portion of were run at University of Pacific. We ran about six, five, six years ago now. And going forward, my my first bulk fills are placed right around five or six years ago with that material, with that material and others like it. We're not seeing any difference between bulk fill and traditional layer and composite. As long as you make sure you're using a bulk fill material with a proper curing light. Right, so if you don't, the curing is important, and we can't take a product that's not developed for bulk fill and put it in bulk. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what's occurring. Is people take a Filtech Supreme, let's say, great material, and they put it in five millimeters and try to cure it. Don't do that. It's not going to work. Now, if you take Sonic Fill, Filtech Bulk One, Dense Spice product, SDR Flow, they work pretty darn well. Dense Spice product is what? Uh, Dense Spice has an SDR Flow. They have a bulk fill flow. SDR. Material. Flow. S S D like D like dog S D R flow. Okay. S D R flow is their right. bulk fill. Correct. And then you said Sonic fill. Who makes Sonic fill? Sonic fill is made by Kerr. So Kerr makes Sonic fill. Densefly makes S D R. Yeah. I think they should name it S T D flow. <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, that one, should be a no big one seller, right? Big seller. <laughs> No one. And then, uh, and then, and then, who? And then, 3M makes the Filtech uh, Supreme. But what's 3M's bulk flow? They have a new one called Filtech Bulk One. Filtech Bulk One. Right. And you think, um, you think these are equivalent to uh, the the layered composites they replaced? The we are. The composites they placed. I do. So I, when we look at the third third party data coming out today, there's no difference. So validated research today shows there's there's no difference in kind of. You know how you could be the lecture. most valuable researcher in the world? <laughs> What's that, that? Well, I, no, I, I'm not kidding, because you are you are a part-time faculty um, at UAP, right? Right. And that is the uh, the greatest dean that ever lived in a dental school was so, um, Art Dagoni. Art Dagoni. And the, uh, you know, when I was in school 30 years ago, the dental school model was the Marine mentality. You're in boot camp, treat you like a dirt, treat you like an asshole, and Art was the first one who said, no, these are our customers, and I, I want these alumni right. to donate money to the university for the rest of their life. And then the, the dental school out here was started by Jack Dillenberg, yep. who yep. Was, idolized Art Dugoni. Yep. And I'm so sorry that Art's um, um, wife passed away. I, that's just got to be tough. But Delta Dental has about 19 different deltas, and Delta of California is the biggest. Right. And the um, CDA whether it be in Anaheim or, or San Fran, has never once had the CEO of Delta ever lecture ever. I mean, it's basically like communism versus capitalism. They, uh, um, you know, these Delta will give some bastard dentist in San Fran $100,000 a year for 10 years. And he only hears from him once a year. And it's some letter that he didn't cover something and they use profanity yeah. and, and Delta and CDA would have Dickerson come in and give lectures called Delta or the devil. Right. It's like, are you shitting me, these guys? Do <laughs> you know what it's like for Delta to go to a California company and get these employers to subsidize their employees' dental insurance and this competitive economy that we're, you know, between um, international competition and artificial intelligence? I mean, there's no margins left. And those boys out there in Delta sell a billion dollars worth of dental insurance and CDA is too arrogant and ass holiness to ever have that guy come in there and tell him their side of the world. Because if you could get Art Dagoni to bring together Delta and UAP or the CDA and start sharing their data, because you guys will do studies of like 100 fillings over five years. They have hundreds of millions of fillings every year just in California going back to the 50s. 
And once you started data mining, then you could go to Google and write an algorithm. And then you could sit back and say, in the state of California, because I know the California dentists all think the people that do all the shitty posterior composites live in Arkansas or Mississippi <laughs> or Kentucky. And you say, just among California dentists, or you could just shrink it to the ones who think they're all that in Beverly Hills and San Jose, you know, and, or, right. and say, look, look at these, look at all these elite dentists. Here's the math on what they do. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, you know, trying to figure out if Russia tainted our elections, I don't give a shit. I want Delta and the ADA to start talking. I, when I talk to the chief economist of the American Dental Association, he can't even get in Delta. And they're right there in Chicago. They don't share because of the abusive behavior that the ungrateful bastard dentists have shared toward their value chain. And you know, you ask a dentist, if there, if there was no checks and balance right now, a crown would cost $4 million and Delta would pay 100%. That's the bubble that dentists live in. No one's going around selling companies to subsidize their employer's cell phones. This mm -hmm. iPhone cost me 800 bucks. Obama didn't pay for it. Trump didn't pay for it. I bought my house, my car, my iPhone. These dentists should be grateful that there's companies that Delta sold Last year, the dental industry in the United States was $103 billion, and Delta was almost 20% of it. Did they get a thank you letter? Oh, hell no. They don't even get invited to the CDA. That's my rant. So you, <laughs> you are right there. You should go to Art Dagoni's house. You should go to the dean of UOP, and you should drag both of those guys into the headquarter of Delta and say, look, we do research. Damn, it'd be nice to see your data, your claims data. And if you had that data, you'd be the most cited dentist on earth because you'd have the most data points on everything. What percent, what percent of the patients who got four quadrupling curatage were edentulous five years later? I want to know that. Delta knows. They just won't let me know. I mean, there's, right. I got a million questions I want to ask that data. Yeah, there's. I think you're absolutely right. There's power of big, kind of big data, and can we get it to happen in dentistry, right? Because all we know is what happens in our individual offices today. There's no aggregation of all this data that's out there, other than the insurance companies who have it, right? But if we can actually tie that back to kind of patient demographics, how things are placed, all these things, dentistry can move forward. We can actually move oral health care forward, right? And it's not about that feeling. And I think that's where this digital spectrum is going to help us. Is all these scanning companies that are out there, at the end of the day, they're collecting lots of data. Let's not kid ourselves about it. So every time we take a scan that's there, that scan is residing somewhere. And ultimately, they'll know that patient was scanned on X date for a crown on tooth number three. And year after year after year, they start to bring all this data together. Is there three shapes or three M's or aligns? They'll know exactly how long that crown's there until the next time it's scanned. Again, for something else. So they're collecting all this stuff. Who, who takes you know, this you know, data and does something useful with it? It's going to be amazing. even scarier? Yeah. I uh, had to do uh, jury duty, okay. and they called me in on a trial, and it was three weeks. Okay. And you just said that you didn't know this guy, and then they pull out a recording of every phone conversation you had with that guy six years ago. <laughs> yeah. Every text message, every, really, you don't know him? Well, isn't right. this your voice? Here's you talking to him six years ago. And I mean, I'm like, oh, my God, because Unbelievable. every FaceTime, every phone call, right. every email right. and text is somewhere. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So That's um, when I talk to um, reps, they tell me that if they ever take in the device to check the dentist curing light, 90% 90, 90 of them, um, parts of it are burned out. It, it's not curing. So, so when you said um, posterior composite, the number one cause of failure rate is probably – you don't even have a strong enough light. Your light's not working. Your light's old. What, what should they think about with their light when they're doing uh, composites? Yeah, I would say a couple of basic things. Is one, number one is to set a regimen in your office to check your lights, right? A radiometer is a start. It's not an absolute, but get even simpler than that. Take a ball of composite, roll it in your hands, get it about two, three millimeters thick, and hit it with a light and see if it actually cures. Are you actually hardening that ball of resin? So I do a really simple, I believe in the kind of simple research. Those little instrument rings that are color-coded, so we identify our hygiene instruments versus our operative instruments, they measure about two and a half to three millimeters thick, somewhere in there. Okay? I think the Hugh Freddy ones might get up to four millimeters, somewhere in there. So we take those, I, and they're blocked down the sides. I squirt some composite in there, and I cure it from the top, 
and I squish out all the stuff that's uncured below. And if it's not, if it's not curing, your restorations in your mouth are not curing. Is we don't need a big research project. We need a 25 cent instrument ring to figure out if our light's producing the energy it should. But let's make sure you know, there's not composite caked on the end of it, the optics aren't broken, work out all the basics. I'm all for saving money. eBay is not the place to get curing lights. That I'm not, I saw an ad not too long ago, is that you can buy 100, or you can buy five curing lights for $100. You know, how is that curing light any different than a blue bulb stuck in a flashlight at Home Depot? I, I don't know. That, is there any curing light that lasts longer or is easier to check? Or um, what, what, if, if someone 25 years old starting a de novo dental practice said, what, what curing light would you buy? What would you buy and why? Yeah, so I think there's three curing lights I look at. I look at the uh, ultra dense Velo light. That thing's a, it's a beast. It's indestructible. Does an excellent job. Uh, Kerr's Demi Ultra Light and 3M's Elapar S10. Okay, ultra dense Halo. Three of uh, Velo, Velo, Velo with a V. Yep. And what was the second one? Uh, Kerr Demi Ultra. Kerr Demi More. Demi, yeah, that's the that's the extended version. You got to pay extra for that one. So. She's missing her front two teeth. Did you see? I that? know. I I did see that. She was on Jimmy Fallon, but she's missing <laughs> her two front teeth. So Ultra so. Dent Velo, um, Kerr Demi Ultra, and then Three M's Elipar Light. Elipar. Elipar. E L I P A R. Huh, those are weird names. Uh, Balo, Demi Ultra, and Elipar. Mm -hmm. I think the marketing department is uh, not working as hard as they could be, huh? So, <laughs> so, uh, and why do you like those three? So those those three lights, I'm I'm a big, you know, I, I like to look at the data and see what the data is showing us today. And those three lights in the last ADA study actually outperformed the gold standard of halogen. The halogen curing lights have been our gold standard, and those three outperformed it. You know, I get concerned when I hear curing lights can cure in one second. You know, oh, here's a curing light, cure in one second and save, you know, 15 seconds a patient. It's like, well, at the end of the day, what do you have, 45 seconds? What are you going to do with that? Or 60 seconds? It's like, no, let's cure the right way the first time. I know. Um, yeah. But the human wants to believe. They start with what they want to believe. Right, right. And what's the most frightening thing is what dentists are sharing on Facebook and they'll have some crazy story, and it'll be from, like, international world news. Uh, dude, I'm sure, <laughs> pretty sure that's just a server in somebody's garage. Right. Why are you sharing a, a story from internet? And then you then you ask that, Dennis, why, why would you be sharing that shit? Well, <laughs> CNN and Fox News, it's all a conspiracy. They're all bought, and, you know, it's just, it's the, the human yeah. mind is, uh, is very bizarre. So, so you talk about building patient relationships through trust. That, that is the... That is the number one element in dentistry. I mean, the, if um, back to the insurance data, right? When you right. diagnose one hundred cavities, the country only drills, fills, and bills thirty eight percent. You say, right. "Well, it's because they don't have money." Well, it's true. One out of three don't wow. buy ever. But right. you take two dentists. It, the data is there always. The dentists yeah. doing seven fifty a year are are filling and drilling and filling thirty eight percent of their diagnosed decay. And the dentist doing a million two, million three, they're doing two out of their three diagnoses. We're just right. talking cavities. We're not talking about veneers sure. and implants sure. and all that stuff. Sure. So, so the difference between you come into my office and I tell you, you need four cavities, and you look at me like, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I really do. And then you leave. Right. That's right. that middle guy. One does it because yeah. you're the doctor. One will never do it because you're probably paid for <laughs> by the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Uh, but that one in the middle – you know, I tell the dentist the most important thing you have to have is a chair side manner that makes people feel at ease and they trust you. What do you what what are your thoughts? How would you help dentists build trusting relationships with their patients? Yes, yeah, so I think l let me go back a little bit of my time. I've been practicing about 16 years now. My wife and I bought a practice about 14 years ago, right? And when we bought it, we were the, kind of the young kids out of school. We think we thought we knew everything. We sat down and honestly, we probably Treatment plan correctly, but didn't build a trust and relationship first, right? So it was all about, here's what you can do. We, here's all the issues we see in your mouth. And they had a lot of kind of supervised neglect, but they loved their prior dentist. He made them feel good every single time, right? All these things kind of went on, and we came in and treatment planned all the different issues that were there. The trust piece was missing. Hindsight is 2020. Now going back in time saying, well, what could I have done differently? You can still educate the patient, 
but it's about understanding them and building the connection with them first, right? See what the value in the patient is first. For God's sakes, ask them their name. What's going on with their child? You know, where, what's important in their life that's happening? And then bring it back to dentistry. And their, if their goal is long-term oral health, great. Here are the issues I see in oral health. Here's what I have to take care of. Maybe we can't do that all today, but over the next X number of years, let's try to treat that and get you to where you want to be. And then show them. Bring the cameras and et cetera, but I never put a patient in ultimatum unless I'm truly scared about their health. I never say you must do this, right? It's about here's what I see, here's the issue that's there, and here's how we can fix it if what's important to you is establishing your health. But if you can't do it today or there's financial limitations, give them alternatives. What are alternatives that are there? And don't just watch things. I, I get irritated today in a place in dentistry where I we say we're going to watch all these things. What are we going to watch to do? Watch it get worse? Instead, let's manage it. You know, sometimes that management is not drilling and filling. That management is helping them get a toothbrush in their mouth, helping them get the fluoride through the water, the regimens that are there, help protect them. And when the time is right, they'll do the surgical therapy restorative dentistry. Right? This, unfortunately, we had to learn during the economic downturn. So I look back at the 08, 09 timeframe, had a lot of my Silicon Valley patients. Yeah, they're made, they may be making over $100,000 a year, but they're still tied to their $1,500 in benefits, right? And they will come in and say, Doc, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. I can't afford to do that crown. So we had to make a decision. Do we just turn them away and say you can't do anything? Or do we manage them? Do we say, fine, we're going to put a large filling in. It's going to buy you some time. Yes, it may break, but it bought you time. Those patients eight, nine, ten years later are very happy with how we treated them. And now we're converting that direct care into indirect care, right? Into indirect restorations. But they believed in us because we didn't shove something down their throats. So I think it's making patients take ownership in their health, but you got to be a partner in the health. You got to be a partner in that's what's there and, and, and show them why they need to do what they need to do. And I think the number one way to build trust when they're doing their Google search is you got to have a YouTube video showing your smiling face and talking. Yeah. And I'd have your wife next to you as a dentist and your kid and your cat and your dog and bring your goldfish with you, show them, show them that you're a human, build that trust. Do you think any technologies build trust? Because you started this show talking about first thing you'd get is an enteral camera. I mean, seeing is believing. It's one thing for me to just have a poker face and say, uh, Prague, you got four cavities. It's a right. whole nother thing to actually show them four black dots on your tooth colored tusk. Sure. So yeah, a couple, a couple things to say. One is uh, the Dexas carry view has helped us a great deal in showing patients kind of cavities and cracks in their teeth. And the second has been uh, the caries detection standpoint with things like uh, the, the new products by Air Techniques they call Spectra. So the Spectra system that will actually colorize the decay or caries. It'll actually show a colorized image that patients can resonate with. So those things get patients to go so again, beyond so sticking. That's the, uh, Air Techniques, what's it called? So Air Techniques had a, has a product called the CAMX, C-A-M. CAMX, P-A-M? Yes. Uh, CAM, like camera. CAMX. C-A-M-X. And then X, CAMX Spectra. Got it. Good old and then, And then Dexas Carry View. Wow. So that is a, uh, that is a neat, uh, neat deal. I've heard of uh, Dexas uh, Carry View. Right. C -A -R -I -V -U. Correct. C-A-R-I-V-U. Correct. But Air Technique shines a new light on Camex Spectre and introduces Camex Alara. Interesting. So you like that, and and you like that because you think it um, um, explains to the pa shows the patient more, so they actually see a cavity than you just saying you have a cavity. Exactly. So I always tell people that you know these devices don't replace our brains, but they help connect with the patient's brain. Right. So they're not replacing ours, but they help connect with the patient. So what these will do is they'll help you kind of find things, track them, and then make a decision ultimately. But patients will resonate with color imaging. It's funny, you know, most dentists today are still poking teeth. We're still poking teeth to see if there's a cavity. And, and yes, does that work? Well, we miss, a lot of the, uh, we miss a lot of the unknowns. We find the obvious, but we miss the things that are not as obvious. So, so trust, intro camera, Carries detection technology like Dexas, Carryvu, or Air Techniques. Um, any other technologies that you think build trust or to help us sell the invisible? Because that's what it comes down to. We're selling right. the invisible. Well, I think we talked about scanners. So scanners are the intro scanners are the other thing I would put in there. 
But how, how's the internal scanner, scanner build trust with the patient? So because so let's take an example today. Um, I have patients who come in there, they're thinking about maybe having orthodontics, you know, Invisalign type of treatment done, something like that, right? And we were starting to talk to them about how in their hygiene visits, their teeth are overlapped and they can't keep them clean. Well, today I can scan that patient's arch form, put it on the machine and show them. It's, you know, looking at that intro camera, but making it three dimensional. So I can rotate things all the way around. I'll tell you a good, uh, an example of the where we first started using this. I had a patient walk into my office and they said, hey doc, I've never had a cavity in my life, but I'm not chewing as well as I once did. I'm like, okay, well that's interesting. Let's take a look in the mouth. Patient opens up and they have massive amounts of erosion. Not a speck of decay. There's not a single cavity anywhere. So they've lost 50% of the posterior tooth structure, all based off of erosion. Significant amounts of reflux that are occurring, and there was some, actually some alcoholism in, in, tuna, in conjunction as well. I scanned their mouth, scanned upper arch, lower arch, bite registration. I put it on my scanner. I explained to them, I go, look, you've never had a cavity in your mouth, but the reason you're not chewing as well as you once did is I can rotate that arch form, pretend you're sitting on the uvula of the tongue, and you can see the teeth don't contact. They were able to see for the first time why they're not chewing. That they're, they have no lingual cuts left. It's all they're all gone. There's nothing that's left there. So now you're telling this patient who's never spent really a dime on restorative dentistry that I need to restore your entire maxilla to get you back to where you were, and it's going to cost X thousands of dollars. That couldn't have happened in the traditional world of X-rays and even a couple of single intraoral camera views, right? Digital scanning allowed a case like that to resonate with the patient. Of what's going on before it would have been algebra impressions, study models, put on an articulator, and then I say, hey, look at all this dentistry in my hand. Patients don't resonate with that. You see a color image on a screen, they get it. They get was that. that alcoholic patient, was he Irish or Russian? <laughs> he was actually neither. Wow. He was neither. Yeah. Who's, who's trying to pretend they're Irish or Russian? <laughs> That's right. My God, have you ever lectured in uh, Russia, Poland, <laughs> Ukraine? They have pitchers of vodka yeah. at room temperature. <laughs> and they pour them where we, you know, what those orange juice glasses they'd have at the CDA. Right. Those dentists there in the morning, they're drinking orange juice or tomato juice and then filling it 50% with vodka. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't kid around with their vodka. Right. Um, you know, um, sorry, I uh, I can't believe I I loved talking to you so much. We went uh, over the hour. Can I, I still had a couple of overtime questions. Can please, I, please. Um, in my three decades out, it seems like the number one variable that predicted success, success being, I love dentistry, I'm not burned out, I'm making money, I'm happy, I'm smiling, I'm having fun, was directly correlated to the hours of continued education. The docs that took 100 hours or plus more, they always crush it. The ones who got their FAGD, their MAG, it's not the FAGD and the MAG, it was the fact that they were taking 100 hours a year and they were, you're a summary of your five closest people when you when you join the AGD, your buddies, your homies were going for it. Right. When you hang out with the guy just because he's across the street from you, he may hate dentistry more than anything, but but you just like watching football with him because he's so damn hilarious because he's just always whining and moaning and bitching about dentistry. Um, so that's why I do this show because they're commuting to work and they just got to listen to you speak for an hour. What what do you what um what do you think about the, these kids coming out of school? What would you tell them who, who now say, well, I, I finished all my requirements and I, I graduated top of my class. I'm done with that. Um, what would you tell them about continuing education? Yeah, so I would say dental school has simply made you a safe beginner, right? And we have to continue to keep learning if we really want to deliver good care to our patients. You know, if you're lucky in dental school, you may have done 20 crowns. Well, fantastic. That could be a really busy month for you at some point. <laughs> right, you may you may do that in a month of what you did your entire dental school education. So I think it's it's surround yourself with people that are going to help you push the envelope, but ethically, right? So it's the go things to standpoint. Say they're going to improve my dental skills. I think things like Facebook and Twitter and podcasts are a fantastic place to start. Get your appetite wet about what's out there in dentistry. But take live courses, take hands-on courses, keep pushing yourself, and then take photography of your cases, so you know where you screwed up. I learned the most from looking back at my old cases because of photograph and knowing where I could have done better. Like I messed up here and I show my mistakes when I lecture. I say, look, here are all the mistakes I made. And we learn from what we go on. It's like, it's never stop learning. You'll, you'll get bored with dentistry if you, start, if you stop learning. As you're, you're, at that point, you're a mechanic. You're not a healthcare practitioner. And um, 
my last question since I uh, uh, went eight minutes over with you. I, I, I seriously, I could listen to you all day. Um, if you, we just had 6,000 kids graduate last week, if right. you had to give them the three minute uh, commencement, say that's my final question, what, what would your message be to the uh, graduation class of 2017 who graduated last week? I would tell Dennis to say, you know, it's a, a phenomenal profession as long as we take care of it, right? So it's our job to be kind of stewards of our profession and take care of it and understand that what we have a responsibility to our patients and their care. Now, with that comes continuing to learn, doing the right thing, but always being cognizant of celebrate your success. You've worked really hard. Come out there and celebrate your success and celebrate things along the way. So take time out for your family. Take time out for yourself. Don't get so caught into your own office, your own little world, but that you, you get to explore the world. So kind of take home message would be dentistry offers us tremendous opportunity and responsibility. We have to be able to do both those things together, right? At, at times when we, do, when we take the responsibility, take the opportunity, enjoy it. Enjoy it and go out and don't feel like you're stuck behind the eight ball at all times. Don't compromise your ethics. Stick with your ethics. That, that's what we have at the end of the day. So I'm going to ask this question last. So if it's if it's offensive or you don't like it, I can just delete it. But can I sure. ask you one personal question? Of course. Your wife is a dentist. Did you meet her yeah. in dental school? Did you marry her in dental school? We did. We we met at a Halloween party. In a dental Halloween. School. <laughs> yeah. But but what what? So there's a lot of husband and wives commuting to work right now, and you've been working with your wife. So you work in the same office with your wife for 14 years, we do. right? We do. And you have a kid together and you live together. Right. Right. Um, so are you in heaven or hell right now? Where we're I, and, and to all the couples commuting to work right now in their 30s and their husband and wife and they're thinking about this and they're thinking, you know, I don't want to ruin the marriage and, and I don't want this nine year old, you know, to be. What advice would you give everybody dating in dental school right now? Because 20 percent of these podcasts are with dental students and the other 80 percent are probably all under 30. What's, what's the marriage advice? So for us, it's been absolute heaven uh, from a standpoint that we both come from families that work together. But even if it wasn't for that, my, my wife has made our, our marriage very successful in the sense that when she leaves the office, the office could be burning down and it doesn't matter. Dentistry is done, right? And we have, I have a rule that says, she has a rule that says no more than one hour of dentistry a day at home. And that's it. And then we turn it off. And we move on with life. I think if you set those parameters and set kind of responsibilities and, and things for each one and don't get in each other's way, you're going to be just fine. So when we're in the office together, the staff knows that we're equal bosses. There's no question. That's there. There's not looking at her versus looking at me. That We each respect one another. We each get out of each other's way at the same time. There are certain things that I should absolutely not be involved with, whether it's the practice life or home life and vice versa, and we stay out of each other's way. We trust one another to get things done. Well, when I talk to staff, you say it's heaven. The staff say that when the husband and wife uh, own the office, it's heaven or hell, depending on if they have an org chart. Because right. if I go to um, Dr. Parag and he says sure. no, so then I run over to his wife, Dr. Duncan, and she says yes. The staff's always, they're always, whenever, the, you know, like every, there, there's a general, there's a major, there's an infantry, there's a pope, yeah. there's a bishop, there's a priest. Whenever there's an org chart, the staff is good, but whenever you have right. two gods, one's lightning, one's thunder, right. and all hell breaks loose. So how do you do the org chart at work? So our org chart is, so my wife and I are equals at work, but we're separated on our responsibilities. So there are certain things that only go to her, and I know not to answer those questions and defer to her, and vice versa. And certain things only come to me. And so the questions, if, if the staff asks her the question, she'll say, let's ask Dr. K. Let's go to defer to him. We'll get the answer from him. And, that, and we separate. We don't cross those lines. So you're right. If those lines are crossed, then we get so played one. So they call one you of, Dr. K? They call me Dr. K, yeah. And what do they call, what do they call her, Dr. D? Dr. D, yeah. Do they? They do. D and K, that, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So when your son doesn't become a dentist, is he going to be disappointing his mom or his dad? Or well, does he, actually he have does, to be a dentist? He does not have to be a dentist. He doesn't want to be. Um, he, he actually has a, another, he wants to be, at this point, a pediatric neurosurgeon. That's what he's decided he wants to do. We'll yeah. see if that pans out. Holy moly, but, I didn't even, yeah. I can't yeah. believe a nine-year-old even knows what a pediatric yeah. neurosurgeon is. Yeah. No, we're blessed. We have a, we have a smart kid, and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a bundle of joy. Uh, well, that's actually, you want him to be uh, um, uneducated so you don't have to pay for college. <laughs> that's right. But that's if he right. wants to be a pediatric neurosurgeon, 
You're going to be paid at least 10 years of college. That's right. We're going to be working a long time. <laughs> it's funny. When you look at dental school indebtedness, the 17% that have no student loans, they all have one thing in common. Mom or dad's a dentist. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, hey, um, uh, thanks for the uh, the mar- oh, and 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 what um, I- any marriage advice to these couples right now? I mean, the most important thing you're ever gonna do is have the institution of marriage, kids, family. Uh, you guys were in school. Uh, you're happily married, 16 years. There's a ton of couples right now driving to work, listening to you. Any any last um, takeaway marriage advice to? Uh- yeah, my only marriage advice would be stay out of each other's way. Trust one another. Have responsibilities for each other, but stay out of each other's way and, and believe and be able to believe in one another. I cannot want to do what I do if it wasn't for the support of my wife. And I 100% know that. My dad told me if you do nothing right in life, I'm very smart. And I think that's what I, I think I was fortunate enough to do that. Because it's going to cost you a lot if you don't. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, but Mary's smart. I mean, you married a, a doctor of dental right. surgery. And right. have you seen the, the, seen the divorce data? If you right. both have a, a postgraduate degree, a master's or doctorate in the same field, you only have a 10% divorce rate. Is it's that really? The, it's wow. the lowest oh. divorce rate in the, in the free love uh, marriage. Right. When you go to like India in arranged marriage, the whole country sure. only averages 10% because right. your mom and dad can pick your spouse better than a kid in, in, in heat. Uh, but <laughs> if you both have a postgraduate degree in the same thing, you have the lowest divorce rate. So those you couples listening right now, if you're husband and wife, Dennis, you got a 90% chance you're going to make it. So, just don't screw up the, the, the other 10%. That's right. All right. Well, hey, dude, I could listen to you all day long. Thank you so much today for coming on the show and talking to my homies. I know they thoroughly enjoyed you. Thanks, Howard. Have a great one. All right. You too, bro.